So when willing to challenge this quandary, it seems a cursory reference to Dejiri's intention is sufficient for many scholars to determine the goings-on of Pokemon for a game to have such a massive impact on digital visual culture. It must be more than a triumph of collective nostalgia and contemporary marketing. And so I point out the centrality of style in the Pokemon universe and how its visual grammar, more than the collective nostalgia of its concept, play a crucial role in its widespread dissemination. So I, my feeling is, is that a lot of neo-baroque art, like the church and so on, they're actually not that ideological in their operation. It's much more about the organization of the imagination in the present tense of experience, that you go and it's like, it's doing, it's working with the imaginary, it's working with cognitive dissonance in a very present tense, rather than in a long, structured, ideological negotiation with an institution or a state apparatus. So, obviously, paper like this doesn't provide the space for me to do that kind of systematic analysis. Um, and so I'm going to focus on the work of Ken Sugimori, who's the original illustrator who produced these images. He produced the designs for the original 151 Pokemon. The same artwork illustrates the infamous, the infamous Pokemon cards, Scourge of Children's Pocket Money, a separate game which shadowed the sudden boom in the popularity of video games and anime around the turn of the millennium. Sugimori doesn't appear in the current scholarly literature on Pokemon. This oversight betrays the orientation of the field toward more cultural and contextual analyses of video games, since the work of contributing artists is conceived critically as less important than a presiding vision of the gameplay and of game culture. That's a bit of a game studies thing, which you guys, you know, doesn't matter so much here. Um, and so, so in game studies, which is where I most often work, there's a tendency to want to look at some kind of essential core ephemeral gameplay thing, rather than just looking at the, 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 the bits and bobs of the game. So this paper, um, so the relationship between uh, Sugimori's art and Tajiri's Pokemon could be compared to the relationship between Sir John Tenniel's illustrations and Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventure in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass or Quentin Blake's work and Roald Dahl. The text and image are interleaved together in the imagination. Tajiri's gameplay and Sugimori's art sit together in that moment of first exposure at the end of the, of the millennium. So in his essay, An Introduction to Otaku Movement, Thomas Lamar suggests that the consumptive pr practice of the otaku, the obsessive collector, incorporate a specific method of viewing in which parts of the character design or the film or the media or whatever are perceived in preference to the whole. There's a taste for looking at the parts. Because, um, and this is because of the subcultural continuities that they signify. In these discrete parts, cat ears, angel wings, priestess robes, a sleek fringe, an epistemology of fan knowledge manifests to stabilize a given design within a long stylistic continuity to which otaku culture is deeply committed. Lamar writes that, as the compulsively replayed videos of such favorite series as Macross are watched, they, the otaku, begin to perceive differences in animation styles within and between episodes. The result was a new attention to what might be considered flaws, inconsistencies, or trivial details by other viewers. And Rikyu, the Japanese concept of Baroque, is implicitly about taking pleasure from the floor in a, in a thing as much as its virtuous organization and, and a, you know, kind of spectacle. So the mimetic stylistic tradition of mangaka and the close scrutiny of the otaku produce two complementary sides to a singular dynamic, intertextuality of style produced at points of both production and consumption. He adds that, quote, these apparently insignificant details become part of the viewing experience making the experience of viewing akin to scanning for information rather than reading a story. In effect, the peripheral becomes central, or rather, there is a breakdown in the visual ordering of central and peripheral that results in a non-hierarchical visual field of information, and the churches and so many of the things we've seen kind of have that quality. So Lamar's identification of a widespread sensitivity to style in the otaku reception of manga, anime, and video games is important as it reinforces the need to examine closely the visual fields created in these media, and in so doing, critically reflect on the considerations made by fans. Since we are still living in the trailing zeitgeist of Pokemania, it's hard to objectively see the artistic impact it's had. How do we separate fad from legacy? 
Surely this, this anxiety explains the absence of any reference to Sugimori in the literature on Pokemon. Okay, I'm going to skip some of this now. So, there's Deshima. So, in, this is an image of a game called Okami. The game looks like this. This is, a, this is essentially a screenshot from the game. This is part of that Edo recuperation that I was talking about. Okay, this sense of um, painted scroll aesthetics and things like that being systematically recuperated in, in Japanese new media by young Japanese who are, who are more conservative and more concerned with nationality than their parents, who, would, who were the first generation to benefit from, for instance, doing overseas masters and things like that, and cheap air travel, and who are more liberal by definition. Okay? Here's a, here's a production piece of artwork by Yoshitaka Amano for Last Blade 2, which is done, again, in the, um, in the sort of um, geijutsu, Japanese, sort of Victorian painting style. Again, this is a kind of sort of recuperation of the prior aesthetic. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about now. So the story of how Pokemon's characteristic visual style develops begins in an earlier Game Freak project, Pulse Man, and this is Pulse Man on the screen here, which featured on the Sega Mega Drive in 1994. Pulse Man was only released in Japan, though a surge of interest in Game Freak vis-a-vis -vis Pokemon has created a new market for the resale of Pulse Man cartridges on auction websites like eBay. The relatively unknown Pulse Man game features many of the elements in, com in common with other games by companies like um, Capcom. So the background story relates to how an ingenious computer scientist named Doc Yoshiyama creates a powerful female artificial intelligence, Sea Knife, and like Pygmalion and Galatea, he falls deeply in love with her. In fact, he falls so madly in love that he downloads his consciousness into the computer system, and in that virtual Eden, they make love, producing Pulse Man. <laughs> he is a human-machine hybrid, able to live in the everyday world as a material being, <coughs> but with the power to channel and transform into powerful bolts of electricity. And the letter S of his namesake is depicted as a jagged lightning bolt from the title screen, as you can see there. After a period of time, Doc Yoshiyama emerges from his own computer system, but is obviously corrupted by the experience. And so he declares that he is now evil Doc Waruyama and establishes a terrorist cell named the Galaxy Gang to spread a wave of cybercrime across the globe. Pulse Man must therefore fight his father creator and preserve the world. At the time of its release, Pulse Man was praised in the Japanese gaming press for a sophisticated graphic style that pushed the boundaries of Sega hardware. Satoshi Tajiri and Ken Sugimori worked alongside Junichi Masuda, the musician who would later score the theme music to Pokemon. The game was unanimously praised in well-known magazines such as Famitsu, for its excellent character design, animation, sound, and gameplay, and, free and was frequently compared to Sega Classics, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Rystar. When critics say that Pulse Man is one of the best looking games produced on the Mega Drive system, what are they specifically referring to? The answer, the answer to such a question helps us to leverage the importance of Ken Sugimori to the legacy of Pokemon and to open up a notion of the Japanese new Baroque. And so the style of Pulse Man signifies a long genealogy of character designs that operate at the core of contemporary Japanese visual culture. Beginning proper in the 1960s with Osamu Tezuka's Astro Boy on the left-hand side of the screen there, um, and Shotaro Ishinomori's Cyborg 009 on the, the, the chap in the middle at the bottom, um, these characters feature in science fiction narratives as heroes fighting against faceless, sometimes occult, sometimes and very often uh, in more recent series, corporate forces. In their design, what is most immediately apparent is the consistency of both the silhouette and the palette.